Welcome to Unlocking the Dream Vision, The Secret History of Creation. I'm your host, author R.J. Von Bruning. In this video series, we will be exploring the mysterious dream vision of Enoch as explored in my book, Unlocking the Dream Vision, The Secret History of Creation. In this first video, we will answer the all-important question of what is the dream vision? If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit the like button below and subscribe for future videos. This series presents information based in part upon theory and conjecture of the system of esoteric symbolism. The purpose is to suggest some possible interpretation, but not necessarily the only one to the many mysteries we will explore. Welcome to the world of the dream vision. In this first video of the series, we must start with answering the all-important question of what is the dream vision? The dream vision could be the most important story you've never heard of before. It is agreed by all biblical scholars, theological experts, historians, and lay people that have read this largely forgotten story that it is a symbolic and allegorical retelling of the entire biblical story that is buried deep within the ancient book of Enoch that uses animals to represent people and groups of people and men to represent angels or higher state of being. Now in order for us to understand this ancient symbolism, we must first understand its origin and the ancient scribes that created it. The ancient scribes may be one of the best known while at the same time one of the most misunderstood class of people in the entire ancient world. I think most people are aware that the scribes were a highly specialized class of people that recorded all the official business of the ancient world. And I think also primarily from TV, because of TV programs, most people think of a dutiful scribe sitting down with a, a scroll or a clay tablet uh, while a powerful king or priest speaks and more or less acting as their personal secretaries. But the ancient scribes were much more than just the personal secretaries for the rich and famous. They were in fact one of the most unique class of people to have ever existed. They also had a much greater influence on the inner workings of the ancient world than almost all are aware of. In order to understand this unique class of people, we need to go far back in time to the very beginning of the, and the invention of writing. Even before the first true writing systems came into existence, it's known that mankind made marks for counting and used symbolic glyphs for unknown religious purposes. It was not until the founding of the first civilizations Primary, primarily ancient Sumer and Mesopotamia, that the first true writing systems developed. The original Samaritan writing system appears to have had its origin in a system that used small clay tokens to represent commodities that were given or received from the temple. These early tokens normally had a small picture of the commodity with a symbol to represent the individual making the transaction. In the earliest civilizations, almost all economic, social, and political activity was centrally controlled by the religious leaders of the temple of that particular city's god. Slowly over time, this primitive record system evolved into a method of keeping accounts and developed into what we call a pictographic writing system. This early form of Pictographic writing primarily used glyphs with simple pictures to directly represent an object or a concept. This early writing was not only for economic activity, but it was also used for communication and recording of important events. There were also the development of specialized glyphs or symbols that came to represent different totems, titles, and names of important people, with much of the symbolism being represented by animal totems. It is out of this early development of pictographic writing that a specialized class of people developed and they were devoted to this type of writing, the scribes. In the beginning, these individuals were primarily drawn from the priestly classes, but slowly over the centuries they were men and women of talent that were drawn from all classes of society. 
It was not until that one fateful day that someone cut off a reed that formed a standard wedge shape that could be used as a stylus to make impressions into soft clay that scribes and writing as a whole fully came into being. It was at this time that the simple pictures or glyphs began to evolve from directly representing objects and concepts to a more ideographic form of writing, where the glyphs became more abstract and incorporated symbols that embodied an idea, a concept, a name, and sometimes even a whole word. The earliest known form of this true writing is called kineoform which over time kineoform also developed into a transitional system of whereby the symbols refer not only to the object or idea which it re represents, but also to the proper name as well. In our modern world, this form of symbolic writing can seem rather alien to us. It, it can be difficult for many to even imagine how a symbol can represent not just an object or a concept, but that it can also be the proper name of the object itself. Although this form of writing can be difficult for us to imagine, there are several similar examples of this type of writing and its use of symbolism that is still in use today. Traditional Chinese is one good example of this type of writing system. This is a writing system that uses a tremendous number of signs, glyphs, and symbols that each represent the minimal unit in a language that carries some meaning. So a sign in this type of system may represent a word or a part of a word like a suffix to denote a plural noun. Because of this, the number of signs, glyphs, and symbols could and has grown to a rather staggering number with formal Chinese having over 10,000 uniquely different signs, although many of them are unused in everyday usage. This great number of signs makes it rather easy to understand how somebody would need to specialize with many years of training and education in order to fully master this type of writing system. And this is exactly the reason this specialized class of ancient scribes developed in the world. In comparison to our own modern world with its widespread literacy, it can be difficult for us to imagine an ancient world where only a small number of highly specialized people could read and write. The next important step is to realize that this small number of scribes went to great lengths to keep this knowledge of writing to themselves, because it gave them an almost magical, godlike power over the masses. What most tend to overlook is the fact that within this small group of elites that could read and write, there was even a smaller group of scribes, the masters, that controlled not only the writing, but they also directly controlled who would be allowed to learn it, and this aided them in becoming the class of people that controlled all the written material. Over time, the scribes became the controllers of all available information. They controlled what was written, what was stored, what was copied, and what would be passed down to the next generation. In time, they became the advisors to kings, generals, including the powerful and the wealthy. They also trained and taught the children of the elites of society, which in time included the priesthoods themselves. It was even thought by some that they even knew the very words of the gods themselves. And as you can now to start understanding, the ancient scribes occupied a unique place in ancient society. Not only did they occupy a unique place in ancient society, but like all groups, they went to incredible lengths to protect it and the power it gave them. This protection of the secret knowledge of writing took many different forms over the countless centuries, with several of them still being with us today. One of the first things the ancient scribes did was to institute a long and drawn out initiation process. This initiation process is believed to have lasted months with it involving a series of grueling physical and mental tests to prove the loyalty and the seriousness toward becoming a scribe. This ritual of initiation is still practiced today with the tradition of college hazing or military boot camp being two very common examples. For many, the most common form of initiation process is that of the priests, rabbis, and umans into each of their respected monotheistic religious traditions after a long training and education process. After this long initiation, the scribes then went on to institute a lengthy educational process that typically lasted for at least a decade, with the entire system broken down into small pieces that were then taught one at a time. 
This teaching system is, has survived to our own day and is the system we have modeled our own education system and schooling systems after. In addition, unlike today, large parts of the education was wrapped up in religious ceremony and ritual trappings that added an additional layer of security to help protect the secrets of writing. Although these training and educational systems worked well at keeping the secret of writing away from the general public, they were less effective for the wealthy and other elites who could afford or had the personal power to force the scribes to teach them and their children the secret art of writing. As you can imagine, this created a unique problem for the scribes, but it also created a unique problem for the religious leaders at the time, since the scribes had their origin in the temple, always keeping close ties with it. With the wealthy and powerful being able to read and write, it became very difficult, if not impossible, for the scribes to hide their secrets from them. In order to get around this unique problem, the scribes, with the help of the religious leaders of the time, came up with an equally unique solution. They developed a system that would become known as mystical symbolism. This appears to be the point in history where the earliest written languages broke into two distinct parts with the first being the sacred, mystical, or religious symbolism only for the initiated, and the other being the profane for day-to-day -day use, which was intended for all those who could read and write. What makes this mystical symbolism so unique is that it normally used animal totems or animal symbols to represent people and groups of people. Additionally, the scribes developed a fascinating and highly complex writing system that intertwined this animal symbolism directly into the text of the story they were writing. This simple system of using animal symbolism to encode a hidden message within a story is still with us today. One of the most common uses of this animal symbolism today is to represent nation states, with the American bald eagle or the Russian bear being two of the best known. This use of animal symbolism may not seem very important or that unique at first, but it is a surprisingly and highly effective way to hide and transmit information, especially when only a small group of initiated individuals know the true meaning of the animal symbolism to begin with. We can use World War II as a perfect example of how this symbolic storytelling is done. If you were to retell the general story of World War II in Europe, with Nazi Germany first invading Poland in the east and then turning their attention to and invading France in the west, which then after the defeat of France, the Nazis then battled with Britain, until turning their attention to the east again, starting with, starting with their invasion and then the long brutal war with Russia on the eastern front. It was at this point that the Nazis seemed to be an unstoppable force. That is, until the United States entered into the war on the side of Great Britain and Russia, was Nazi Germany ultimately defeated after numerous great and terrible battles. Now, if we take this very simple general outline of World War II in Europe and replace it with the nation state, each nation state with their commonly known animal symbol, we'll get an entirely different story. Not only do we get an entirely different story, but it becomes a story that does not sound like a massive, brutal war that killed tens of millions of people. We instead get a story of how a terrible and very evil black eagle became so greedy and who lusted for so much power that it first attacked and invaded the lands of the white eagle to the east. And after defeating the great white eagle, it moved into the lands of the Gaelic rooster to the west. And after defeating the proud Gaelic rooster, it then battled with the mighty lion of the north, almost defeating him from the air. Once the black eagle saw that it could not defeat the mighty lion of the north, it's turned its attention to the east again and invaded the lands of the great bear, inflicting a great wound upon that mighty bear. The evil black eagle seemed to be a great unstoppable force until the great bald eagle from across the sea heard the cries of the white eagle, the Gaelic rooster and the mighty bear. The great bald eagle then mustered all its strength and came to the lands of the other animals, uniting with the mighty lion of the north and the great bear of the east, then together, fighting as one, after countless battles with much death and untold destruction, they were finally able to defeat the terrible black eagle and remove his evil from the world. As you can now understand, this incredibly simple little change of replacing each nation state with their national animal symbol radically changes the entire story. If you were unaware of this symbolic connection between the animal symbolism and the nation states of World War II, you would, almost, you would most likely interpret this story in a completely different manner. 
In this symbolic form, it seems more like an old fable as a moral or ethical meaning to it instead of a symbolic retelling of the most destructive war in modern human history that killed tens of millions of people. This is basically what the ancient scribes did in order to hide their information right out in the open. One of the primary things that the scribes did differently was that they worked this animal symbolism directly into the text of the story they were writing, thereby creating a story within a story. This use of animal symbolism to encode, encode messages into other stories by the scribes appears to have been universally used by all the different scribes of the ancient world. It's not until the founding of the great legendary Library of Alexandria that the use of this animal symbolism became standardized. Not only did its use become standardized, but it also hit its highest point of development with the crowning achievements in the books that we now call the Bible and the dream vision that is contained with the ancient book of Enoch. It's not so much the actual library itself that is important here, but the school that it housed. The school became known as the Alexandrian School of Philosophy. It was founded at almost the same time as the Great Library itself by its famous founder, Alexander the Great. This school was born out of, out of Alexander's intention of making Alexandria the seat of his empire. He invited all the learned men from all the nations that he had conquered with their particular notions and philosophies. This had the effect of bringing together Orientalists, Jews, Egyptians, and Greek thinkers and teachers. Even by today's standards, the school became very eclectic in its character and exhibited a great mixture of opinions of the Egyptian priests, Jewish rabbis, Arabic teachers, and many disciples of Plato and Pythagoras. It is from this school of philosophy that the belief systems known as Gnostics or, and Kabbalah have their origin. This is also where the animal symbolism and the allegory that, it was, that was created by the scribes began to develop into a more universally standardized system of symbolism. Not only did this school give birth to Gnostics and Kabbalah, but it also gave birth to many other schools of thought. One of the most important and equally misunderstood is the one that is now known simply as the esoteric which is information or knowledge that is intended for or likely only to be understood by a small group of people with specialized knowledge or interest, as opposed to exoteric, which is intended for or likely to be understood by the general public, especially when it comes to a doctrine or mode of speech. These esoteric schools of thought were deeply rooted and heavily based on understanding the true meaning of the ancient animal symbolism that's, that was used by the scribes. Also, as you will learn, the secret to understanding this mysterious mystical animal symbolism is contained within the dream vision of Enoch. You will also learn that not only is the dream vision of Enoch the key to unlocking this ancient mystical symbolism, but it's also the key to unlocking the mysterious symbolism of the Bible and the many secrets it holds. For many, that may sound a bit strange that the Bible and the ancient book of Enoch hold the secret to understanding this ancient esoteric knowledge and the true meaning of the animal symbolism. But two of the most celebrated teachers of the ancient Alexandrian school of philosophy, Aristophanes and Plato, put forward the same idea. Both men basically taught the same theory almost a hundred years apart from each other that is still carried into the actual practice of the esoteric religions and brotherhoods of today. That theory is that the sacred writings of the Hebrews were by their system of allegories and symbolism are the true source of all religious philosophical doctrine. The literal meaning which was alone for the common people and the esoteric or hidden meaning being kept only for the initiated. This ancient theory from the Alexandria School of Philosophy is the cornerstone in understanding that there are two stories contained with the ancient sacred writings of the Hebrews, a literal story and meaning for the general public, the exosteric, and the hidden one that is told through the symbolism and allegory that is contained within the literal story, the esoteric. That is only for the initiated. This complex system of mystical animal symbolism and its allegory that was created by the ancient scribes as a method of communicating secret knowledge 
is easier to understand once you realize that some of the greatest minds of the entire ancient world had their hand in creating it. But this system was only for the initiated. This complex system of mystical symbolism with its allegory that was created by the ancient scribes as a method of communicating secret knowledge is easier to understand once you realize that some of the greatest minds of the entire ancient world had their hand in creating this esoteric system of mystical symbolism, but only for the initiated. It is also easier to understand that over the centuries, this system would come to incorporate incorporate other symbolic elements that were taught at the Alexandrian School of Philosophy with Euclid and Pythagoras and their mathematics being two of the best well known. The primary reason this knowledge of the ancient symbolism was lost to the general public was simply due to the invention of the printing press in the 1400s. This led to the mass production of books, books which in turn made it much easier to teach people how to read and write than it was to continue to try to teach the symbolism and the hidden allegories and stories contained within it. Now that we have a better understanding of the origin and the importance of this ancient mystical animal symbolism system that was created by the scribes, in our next video we'll take a closer look at the ancient book of Enoch and its mysterious author, Enoch. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit the like button below and subscribe for future videos.